Buongiorno, introduciamo adesso il prossimo ospite, ma eh, prima di farlo eh, volevo dire che il, lui parlerà in inglese, quindi ripeto che eh, scaricando la nostra app, l'app la Wireless Fest, si può facilmente avere sul vostro cellulare la traduzione simultanea. Ora eh, veniamo al prossimo ospite che è il capo del Google Research Europe, che è il centro di ricerca di Google più grande al di fuori degli Stati Uniti. Ovviamente, dato il tema della giornata, si occupa di intelligenza artificiale, è un gruppo eh, nato nel 2015 che più specificatamente si occupa di machine learning e di algoritmi e di far comprendere ai computer il linguaggio naturale. Ma eh, lascerei la parola a lui per spiegare molto meglio quello che fa. Emmanuel Mogenet. Thank you. Hello, uh, so my name is Emmanuel Mogenet. Uh, I apologize, I'm going to speak English. Uh, my Italian is not that great. So I live in Zurich and I lead a artificial intelligence research lab in Zurich. Uh, we have about 130 people uh, that work on understanding natural language, understanding images and sound and on machine learning itself. And this is what I'm going to be telling you about today. I'm going to try to maybe explain to you a little bit what machine learning is, because everyone's talking about artificial intelligence, but uh, it's important that everyone starts to really understand what these things are. So first, uh, unless you've been living under a rock, machine learning is something that's becoming more and more important. Every technology company is investing massively into it and Google in particular, we're starting to use it all over the place. So this is our CEO, and uh, this is the message he's been sending for the past two years. Machine learning is a core transformative way by which we're rethinking everything we're doing. We, we had to take two very hard turns at Google. The first one was to move from desktop to mobile, because you know the way people use computers completely changed. And the next turn that we absolutely, absolutely have to take is machine learning. We need to basically invest in intelligence, artificial intelligence, in all of our products. To give you a very quick overview, today, machine learning is already used in all of these products. I'll go uh, towards the end into more detail, but uh, all of these things are, are practically using the technology today. Uh, this is the number of internal projects that are using machine learning at Google. Right? You can see a very nice hockey stick. Uh, curve here, but basically we're going to get to the point where everything we do at Google has is based on machine learning or is using a component. That's machine learning. So this is what I'm going to, you know, use uh, 20 minutes of your time today to try to do, try to make you understand what machine learning is without getting too technical. The one thing we've been trying to do with computers since the day we invented them is try to teach them to do useful things. Right? A computer by itself is just a chunk of hardware. It doesn't do anything unless you actually program it. And the traditional way to teaching computers was just that, programming them. And this is what a program, quote unquote, looks like. Right? Programming a computer, aka teaching it to perform a task, is like teaching a very young child how to execute a cooking recipe. Right? You have to give the young child, a very detailed list of steps that he will follow blindly. Um, here's one thing you've always all been exposed to at some point in your life. This is long division. I'm sure it's cool. You've had to learn this. This is the exact kind of thing that computers are good at. And this, when you program a computer, you basically do what your teachers did to you back when you were a kid, teach you how to apply the recipe of performing a long division blindly without really understanding how it works, by the way. The problem with traditional programming, it's got a lot of disadvantages. First, it's very complicated, right? If you write a long program, it's, it's, it requires a lot of skills from the programmer. It's very fragile, brittle. If the programmer didn't think about a specific problem ahead of time, when the computer is faced with that particular situation, it won't know what to do. This is why we had uh, exploding space, sh space shuttles, right? Some piece of code in the, in the control of the engine was facing a situation that it, the programmer hadn't thought about, and it blew up, right? All programs, all, all traditional programs are like this. If the programmer doesn't think of everything possible situation ahead of time, things go very bad. 
it's a very painful way to teach computers. Uh, you know, if you're a programmer, I am a programmer, it's to, to do anything complicated takes forever, right? So and you want to get to the end, and there's so much to do. But here's the most important thing. You can only teach a computer the traditional way if you yourself, the human, understand how to solve the task. So long division, perfect, or long multiplication, perfect. You, the human, understand how to solve the text, so you can teach it to a computer. You can, you can actually write down the recipe. What about all the things that you do without understanding how you do them? There's actually a, a, a very, very large category of problems that fall uh, in, in this bucket, right? Um, I'll give you an example. Most of you, I suspect, know how to walk, right? You do it without thinking. You walked here, right? Can you actually explain how you walk down to the level of how every single muscle in your body moves when you do the walking? I bet you you can't. It's, it's something we do without thinking, but it's actually an extremely complex task. As of today, there's no robot that can walk as well as human does, right? Another very simple example, if I show you a picture and I ask you if there's a cat in it, most of you in the room will be able to say yes or no almost, almost instantaneously, right? You don't even need to think about it. Can you explain to me how you decided that there was a cat or no cat in the image? I bet, I bet you can't, right? There's very many things that humans do that are exactly like this. We do them intuitively without thinking about it, but we can't explain how we do them. And therefore, we cannot teach computers how to perform those tasks. This is the main problem with traditional programming. This is where machine learning comes in. This is, you know, I spoke about the old way. Machine learning is a new way of teaching computers, if you will, a new way of programming computers. So these are the, you know, advantages of machine learning. Converse to the old style programming, machine learning is robust. And what I mean by this is when a machine learning system is faced with an unexpected situation, it tends to do the right thing naturally. Contrary to the old program, we would go like, oh, I haven't been taught how to handle this situation, therefore I'm going to crash. It learns by example. You do not need to explain to the machine how to solve tasks. You just show it how you, your, the human, does it. And if you show it enough times, it eventually learns by itself. Um, yeah, no need to explain. Just show, right? Think of a teacher which, instead of explaining you the principle of how to bake a cake, just manufacture a thousand cakes in front of you. Eventually, you'll know how to bake cakes without a single word having been spoken. Yeah, it's, it's ideal for the kind of tasks I described earlier, fuzzy, ill-defined tasks where we struggle to define or to explain how we perform them. Speaking, walking, recognizing things, style. Like, you know, you can, you can recognize the style of a Van Gogh painting, right? How do you codify this explicitly? When you have noisy data, what, what I mean by noisy data, it's sometimes you get a lot of data and some of it is bad. Some of, some of, some of it is incorrect. But as long as the majority of the data is correct, if there's dirty data in there, machine learning handles it without any problem. There's some disadvantages. Uh, you know, it needs a lot of data to learn, much more than humans. Humans typically need five pictures of a cat to learn what a cat is. Machines need in the order of a million. So, you know, they still have a lot of uh, catching up to do to humans. Okay, without going into too much details, there's three large categories of machine learning. And I'm going to talk about the first, supervised learning. To use an analogy, think of you have a teacher that's dedicated to helping you learn, and every time you make a very simple mistake, he immediately steps in and says, no. Nope. Or when you get it right, say, yep. Yeah. Right? This is supervised in the sense that a human is teaching the machine very precisely how to do things. So how does this work? This is where we're getting to the part where the, you know, this is what we show the computer. We not only show it the picture, the picture is the question, right? But we also tell the computer the answer is yes for this picture. The question being, is there a cat in the picture, of course. We also show the computer this picture. The question is the same, is there a cat in the picture? 
and we give the answer to the computer. We say no. This is called a labeled training set. We have a lot of pictures, and for each picture, we have a label that say, yes, there's a cat, no, there's no cat. And the data, the training set is a million pictures, typically. So what we do is we show, the, we show all of these pictures, the very, very large amount of pictures, to the computer, and every time we ask the, the computer the question, cat, no cat, if he gets it wrong, we punish him a little bit. If he gets it right, we reward him a little bit. So it's the carrot and the stick, basically. But we do this over billions and billions of iterations, and every time we make a very tiny connection to uh, correction to the way the system behaves. How the system is built. So the interesting thing about machine learning is it's inspired from the way the human cortex, visual cortex, actually works, right? So what you see here is, is what you know, is actually powering the AI revolution that you all heard about. It's called deep neural networks. It's, it's computer systems that are architected in the same way the human brain is architected, specifically the visual cortex. And it's basically layers upon layers of tiny little processing units, each of which does something very stupid, very simple. But the data comes in, so the raw data that comes in on one end is the picture of a cat. As you go deeper and deeper in the network, the cats get broken down into recognizable pieces. Each of these recognizable pieces gets associated with an actual concept, um, concept. And once you get to the output, the combination of all these concepts lead to the, yes, this is a baby cat, right? But if you, so it's, 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 like, a, it's like a machine that transforms information, right? You put a lot of information that you don't understand at the entrance, and on the other side, you get very, very tiny pieces of information, but with very high semantic content. So if you think about it, this is what I'm, what I'm talking about at the bottom. On the left, you get massive amounts of data. And on the right, you get very tiny data. But here, the semantic density is very low. The interesting information divided by the amount of information is, is almost close to zero. On the other hand, what you're left with is baby cat. Very small amount of information with very high semantic content. That's what neural networks do. They, they're, they're like a squeezing a lemon, right? They take lots of data and squeeze what's really interesting about that data out. Examples of what current neural network can do. Uh, what you see on the left is what you give to the network, and what you see on the right was comes out on the other end. So if you say, you put a picture of rice, the network is going to say rice. If you say, put a sound wave on the left, which is lots of data that's hard to understand, the computer is going to convert it to text, right? This is what you have on your phones today when you speak and you, you, know, you have voice recognition, basically. Um, it can translate. You know, what you can put in the entrance is one language, and it, what comes out the other end is another language. Or you can even have a full description of a scene, right? Put that picture, and this is what comes out of the other of the of the neural network. So this was supervised learning. Remember, we have all the questions with all the answers, and every time the machine gets it wrong, the teacher steps in and say, "Hey, wait a minute, right?" There are situations that are a lot harder. Um, I suspect you've heard about the AlphaGo win. You know, we've beaten the strongest human at uh, at the game of Go using artificial intelligence. There, the question is very simple. Here's a board, and the answer is, what is the best move, right? But we do not have labeled data because we humans don't know what the best move is at a given, for a given board. All you know is after playing many, many, many moves, at the end, you get a yes or no, right? You win or lose. But the win or lose is not a immediate answer. It's an answer that's after many, many decisions are made. This is what's called semi-supervised learning, in the sense that the teacher here is much, much nastier than the previous teacher. The previous teacher was really helpful. He would always teach you when you got it right or wrong. Here, the teacher is letting you go, and then after an hour of you doing right thing, wrong things, he basically either slaps you or give you a carrot, right? That's a lot harder to, to learn this way, right? Because you don't know which of your moves were right or wrong. 
So yeah, the main application is is you know building a system that taught itself how to play Go in order to be the the, the best human player. But semi supervised learning is harder. It doesn't work as well as the first uh, category. And then the next frontier is unsupervised learning, where you have absolutely no feedback. You basically have data, and you sort of have to organize it without knowing anything about whether you're doing right or wrong. This is active research area, which uh, we're you know, struggling with, to be honest. But here's what's uh, happening in the world. So everyone in the last 15 years has been hearing about um, big data. Right, so you, it's, 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 a, it's a big hype. It's like, you know, every company out there has to collect big data. Every company out there, if you don't have big data, you're going to be in trouble. It's strategic, yada, yada, yada. So everyone started to collect gigantic amounts of data. Great. Google did the same thing. You, Street View is a perfect example of big data. We've started to film the entire world, right? So we have petabytes and petabytes of images on disk of the world, right? Great. What do you do with it? If I have a question like, you know, where's the nearest baker? Oh, the answer is in there somewhere, <laughs> right? In the petabytes of images of the world, there's the answer to my question. But I can't do anything with it, right? I can't connect the question to the answer. On the other hand, if you can get to the raw picture to annotating what's going on in the picture, then you have what's called, you know, the, the picture is what's called unstructured data. And the annotations are structured data. Now you can ask questions. Now you can do something with it. And this is where machine learning really makes a difference. It's the tool. It's the, it's the lemon squeezer. It's the tool that takes unstructured data and then transforms it in, in data that's useful, that can be used to have business insights, to understand what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, this is the example I always use. Imagine you have a factory floor. That's actually a real example of a company we work with. They've heard the whole big data hype. So they've started to film everything that happens in their factory. Every single second from every angle is filmed. Great. They have you know, piles of hard drives with images now. The question is, how do I optimize my assembly line? How do you get from that pile of images to the answer to, oh, this process can be improved by moving, say, this machine from this position to this position? Only a human can do that. And they have to basically watch the data, right? Machine learning can help solve that type of problem. OK, so this, this is what I was talking about. I was a little ahead of myself with the slide. Here's a, an interesting piece of information. Now that the big data hype has been bought into by everyone, 90% of the information that's owned by companies in the world is unstructured, meaning it's there. It's, it's a little bit like those people that get themselves frozen, hoping that the technology will evolve to the point where they can be revived, right? There's a big pile of data. Maybe one day they'll be useful. But right now, without machine learning, not much you can do with it. So the big picture of all this, if we take a step back, is this. Think of the Industrial Revolution for a second. The Industrial Revolution was about raw materials and energy both of which were not easily available everywhere, right? There was two stages in the Industrial Revolution. One was about making energy and raw materials more available, right? This is why we build trains, we build mines. And then the second stage was basically taking that raw material and that energy and making them into products that can be used by people in everyday lives, right? There's, there's really the two stages in, in the Industrial Revolution. With the information revolution, the exact same thing is happening. Information was scarce. I grew up in the 80s, where buying a magazine about computers in the small town in France I grew up in was like a, an adventure, right? So it's 30 years ago, getting information was difficult, right? The internet has solved the first part. It's make information available to all and very much abundance. But now we need to get to the second stage, which is now that there's abundance for information, we need to, to do the manufacturing, to do the transforming it into something useful. This is where machine learning comes in. OK, so takeaways from all the things I've said. 
Machine learning is a new way to program computers, which means to teach them how to do things. It works really well for fuzzy data, for things that we can't explain well. It can transform unstructured data, big chunks of data that we don't know what to do with, into highly structured data, which is essentially something you can use, something you can get insights from. It is very robust to unexpected scenarios. If, if the, the, the thing that was controlling the, the, the space shuttle engines had been written using machine learning, it would very likely have done the right thing in the face of the unexpected. Two things I didn't mention, a couple of things I didn't mention, but that's worth for you to know. Why is everyone talking about machine learning these days? What has powered this revolution? Availability of data. The, the, you know the million pictures of cats I was speaking about? When I was a kid, there's no such thing. There's no way on earth you could have found a, a million picture of a cat, right? You would get to a library, maybe the, the most you would get is like 200 pictures of a cat, right? So the internet has solved that, part, that first problem. Second, computing powers. Uh, so one very funny thing happened. Um, you know the, 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 the GPUs, the things kids put their computers into in order to play 3D games? Uh, turns out that the, the kind of computation they're doing is exactly the same kind of computation we need to do machine learning. So it turns out that five years ago or 10 years ago, you could go down the, the, the shop around the corner, buy five GPUs, put them in your PC at home, and suddenly you'd have a machine learning supercomputer. It, it's some one of those lucky break that uh, the industry gets, right? GPUs turned out to be the, the like sledgehammer for solving machine learning problems. So huge amount of computing powers, widely available to all. And then new modern algorithm, the deep learning things that I was talking about, the deep nets, right? Which is a somewhat new ID and started to work. Okay. Um, I want to get to you know, how we use machine learning at Google, get uh, out of the explaining how machine learning works to what we actually do with it today. So I, I, I showed this slide initially, right? These are uh, products that are either fully using machine learning or use it, using it in one fashion or the other. Photos, for example, today. If all your personal photos, if you store them in the Google Cloud, you can now search them by keyword. I can say to Google, OK, Google, show me pictures of my son riding a bicycle at the beach. And sure enough, it will regurgitate all those pictures. And I have, I think, 60,000 pictures on my phone, right? There's no way I can find them myself, right? And then there's no way, we, we take so many pictures, there's no way you're going to actually label them yourself, saying, this is my son, he's at the beach, and there's a bicycle, right? So what does Google do? Whenever you take a picture, we feed it through a machine learning stack that actually looks at the pixels and says, ah, there's a bicycle in there. Oh, and there's your son. And there's a beach. And there's the ocean. And then we, we actually create a bunch of little labels, little words, describing what's going on in the picture. And when I say, show me pictures of my son at the beach, then it's just a search problem. Just have to find the, the right pictures with the right words next to them. Uh, Translate is another shining example of machine learning where neural networks are now beating humans. Right, we are, we're at the level where, um, say, a Japanese to English translation is as good as a human, except maybe when you're translating a book, and then you have to really understand the whole story to do the proper translation. But for like one pagers, we're at human level of translation. Uh, without getting into details, all of these uh, products use machine learning today. Uh, search, right, actually a machine learning system has learned the old Google algorithm. Right, the, 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 the old search algorithm that was crafted by hand, that was written by engineers using rules, we basically unleashed a neural network on it, and it's relearned the whole thing, basically. Uh, sp speech recognition, when you talk to your phone, again, neural networks, uh, we just show them example pairs, like here's a sound wave, here's what it actually means, here's a sound wave, and then billions of them, and now it recognizes your voice. Translation, but this time combined with computer vision, right? Not, not only do we, so there's two, two, two machine learning systems connected to each other. One that goes from pixels to words, and then the one that goes from word in a language to word in another language. The hope is one day you'll be able to walk the, down the streets of Tokyo with your phone and just be able to read everything. 
right? Because the phone is instantaneously recognizing everything that's written and translating it in, in real time. That actually starts to work. Uh, if you download the Translate app on your phone, you can play with it. It's still not at the point of being able to translate everything in a street, but for like a menu, for example, it works really well. Uh, photos, which I mentioned. Yeah, of course, uh, you know, guess what powers these, uh, the, the self-driving cars? At the heart of it, there's a whole bunch of machine learning algorithms. Uh, this one's interesting. Um, remember me telling you about the fact that machine learning can handle fuzzy, ill-defined IDs? Style is one of them. When you write, every one of us has a different writing style, right? A machine learning, if you take a video of yourself writing, you need to write for about 20 minutes and it will learn your writing style. And after that, you give in text, it will just write exactly like you do, right? That's another interesting one. Um, computers can learn painting styles. This is the original Van Gogh painting, Starry Night. We've used a whole bunch of Van Gogh painting to teach the computer Van Gogh style. Yeah, again, if I ask you to define what style means, you'd be hard pressed, right? We've given it a photo and asked it to paint that photo using Van Gogh style. Right, so it's basically a computer that has learned to paint, how to see the world how Van Gogh sees it. Yeah, we talked about this earlier, which is, this has been a huge achievement, by the way. I mean, for any one of you guys who play Go, Go is the least, you know, chess is a very mechanical game where you, you can apply rules and reasoning and all this, but Go, when you talk to a professional Go player, he, t he talks about very intangible ideas like thickness, taste, uh, ill-shaped or influenced, none of these things can be explained exactly, right? These are all mushy, unexplainable things. And, uh, well, the machine has learned them somehow, right? By looking at millions and millions of human games. More serious application of machine learning. Uh, we've unleashed machine learning on the problem of data center control. So controlling the energy consumption in a big data center is a very complicated problem. Here on the left is what human, the best human could do. We've just let machine learning look at how humans do it for about six months, and then we give the machine learning control of the data center uh, cooling and power systems. 30% gain in efficiency without having to explain the machine how to do anything. Just look how, how humans do it, basically. I'm not going to stay long with that slides, but these are all the areas where you can find immediate application of machine learning. Think of it anywhere you have a labeled data set, anywhere where you have a big stack of data with the question and the answers, you can train a machine learning system almost, almost immediately to basically handle the new cases. A uh, good example, recognizing credit card transaction fraud, right? Uh, if all the transactions that the bankers have, they can use to teach the machine how to recognize what a fraudulent transaction is. And then when a new transaction comes in, magic, the machine generalizes and is capable of, of handling it. Last thing I want to mention before I let you guys go, um, we're doing a lot of things to make machine available to the rest of the world. First and foremost, uh, we have something called uh, the Google Cloud Platform. And then on the Google Cloud Platform, we have something called Cloud ML, Cloud Machine Learning. If you develop cloud machine learning solution, you can run them on Google's cloud. You'll benefit from, um, yeah, so there's, there's, without going into details, there's very high level computer, uh, a cloud machine, sorry, machine learning algorithm available in our cloud. You can use the Translate API if you have text to translate. You can use something, you give it images, it tells you what's present in the images. Uh, we can convert sound to, uh, sound to text. We can also try to understand natural language, meaning understand the semantic meaning of a sentence. Um, you can also, and now I'm going to get to TensorFlow, if you're doing your own machine learning models at home, so to speak, on your, on your, with your own research team, you can basically run it very cheaply on Google Cloud. I want to mention TensorFlow. Um, Google believes that machine learning is a really, really transformative technology. It's going to be huge. It's going to change the way we live. It's going to change the way we work. It's going to affect our lives in a positive fashion very, very greatly. And it's very important that everyone has access to it. So all the stuff that we do internally, the tools that we use, the research that we conduct, we publish. Uh, TensorFlow is our 
machine learning platform at Google, and we have open sourced it. So it's on GitHub. Anyone can download it. Anyone can change it. Anyone can work with it. Um, yeah, the idea is, you know, we really want to make sure that everyone sort of is on the boat of, of the machine learning thing, and you know, using TensorFlow is the, the basic idea. Another thing that's interesting, we are investing in building hardware that's dedicated to executing machine learning algorithm cheaply. Um, you know, I mentioned GPUs earlier. So traditional computers are very bad at doing machine learning. What I mean by very bad, they're very slow and inefficient. The architecture of the hardware is just not designed for the kind of computation that machine learning needs. GPUs, slightly better, much better, actually. But that doesn't beat a chunk of silicon that has been really engineered to execute machine learning algorithm as fast as possible. And we've done this at Google. We've built something called a tensor processing unit, which basically can execute deep nets way faster than anything that's out there. And if you run your stuff on the Google Cloud, we'll run them on TPU for you. The cost is basically going to be one-tenth of an anything else you can, uh, you can use out there. That is the latest, uh, the latest TPU. Um, so there's we basically burned the, the biggest silicon chip that's ever been built to do machine learning. And uh, this is uh, like four racks of, I forgot how many units. I think there's 64 of those chips in each of the racks. Okay, with this, I uh, would like to thank you very much for having me.